Hi, I'm Russ Capper, and my guest today is Dr. Billy Cohn, renowned cardiac surgeon, director of the Center for Device Innovation, holder of 90 patents, leader in the development of the continuous flow implantable artificial heart, occasional trombone player, yep. and magician. Yep, yep. Billy, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay, I would also want to say, you know, a champion of innovation big time. Would you accept that? Yeah, I think so. I, I'm, uh, I'm passionate about my own innovative efforts and do everything I can to help others. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's really cool that you're the director now of the, uh, the device center at the J Labs. The, it made me want to go back and look when you first started really getting interested in innovation. And I saw you speak recently. Uh, and you uh, showed your first innovation that involved a spoon. Share that with us. Sure, yeah, well, so I was very fortunate. You know, to become a heart surgeon, uh, you train year after year after year after year. And I did that in Houston, Texas, which was sort of the epicenter of heart surgeon in the era that I trained. And I was surrounded by giants in heart surgery who were very innovative, who developed a lot of the technology we take for granted today. And it was so inspiring for me, and I admired them so much, of course, I wanted to be like them, especially because there were some real great examples of these monumentally impactful innovations that had such humble beginnings. And when you actually backed it to its origins, to its headwaters, if you, were, if you will, the first thing they did was so simple. It was within the, the abilities of all of us. And I thought, I could perhaps be like that. I could do that kind of work. And so I aspired to. The spoon thing was just the first uh, stabilizers to hold the heart still so you didn't have to stop it during bypass surgery. And I went and watched one. I immediately recognized some of the shortcomings of the current technology, as did everybody in the room. It wasn't, it wasn't a strike of brilliance, but everybody else said, yeah, this is challenging, where I said, I bet there's ways we can make it less challenging. And that became a successful product. And that sort of forged uh, you know, the rails on which my life has, has traveled for the last 25 years. Okay, describe the innovation of that spoon that you yeah. used to hold on. So one of the operations I was doing a lot of is coronary bypass. In coronary mm -hmm. bypass, we take veins from the legs or an artery from the back of the breastbone and use it as plumbing uh, to bypass blockage in the arteries on the surface of the heart. And since the heart is doing this, it's moving all the time, and your mm -hmm. heart's beating 80 times a minute, yeah. 42 million times a year, and these arteries are about as big as the handle of a lollipop. They're really small and the walls are very thin. To put precise stitches in them, everything's gotta be very motionless and there can't be a lot of blood around. Uh, for example, we'll make a slit in the artery about a quarter of an inch long. And around that slit, we'll put 16 little stitches. Yeah, and the, and the thread we use is almost so small that you can't see it with your naked yeah, eyes. We yeah, wear big yeah. telescopes on our mm. eyes. So, Historically, we would put tubes and hoses into the different chambers of the heart, suck blood out of the patient, put it through a machine that pressurized it, added oxygen, took out the carbon dioxide, filtered it, and then pumped it back to the patient through a second tube. That allowed us to clamp off the heart, pack it in ice, so everything was nice and motionless. It was like operating on something from your grocer's freezer. Mm -hmm. I mean, just sat there. Mm -hmm. That was great. But we realized that the risk of putting the tubes and hoses mm -hmm. in and more importantly, the risk of having your blood go through all this plastic hoses and machines right. was considerable, especially in old sick patients. For example, you're healthy. If I put you on the heart-lung machine for an hour and did an operation on you, at the end of that hour, you'd weigh 20 pounds more than you do right now. Wow. It'd all be water. All your blood vessels start to leak. The water goes in your muscles, in your face, in your arms and legs. That's okay, you're healthy. Over the next two days, you would urinate it out. Okay. But if you're really sick, if your liver was just hanging in there, if you had some early organic brain disease, if your lungs were just hanging right. in your kidney, that swelling, that water right. can finish them off. Right. So we started realizing there's an opportunity to come up with a way to do bypass surgery with a heart still beating that might be safer. Well, people had started doing it, and my chief said, Billy, why don't you go down and check out how they do this? This could be very interesting. I thought, great, my first you know, innovative effort. Right. And I went to Johns Hopkins and watched this guy doing the operation. He had a second heart surgeon there, and that heart surgeon had a two-pronged fork, and he mashed down on the surface of the heart to hold it still. So the rest of the heart's lurching around, but right between the two prongs of this fork, it was pretty still. But if he mashed down too hard, the heart couldn't fill between beats, and the anesthesiologist would say, hey, let up, let up, let up, because the blood pressure would start going down. Or if he let up too much, the heart would slip out. 
and the surgeon had to stop operating, reposition him, say, you okay? All right, let's go. So it took three times as long to do the sewing. His assistant was working even harder than he was. It was very stressful. At the end of the operation, I said, you know, congratulations, that's really amazing. Um, but it looks like your assistant has a really hard job. He goes, yeah, I'm glad I've got Duke here. This famous heart surgeon was assisting him that day. I said, uh, I'm glad I've got Duke here to help me. And I said, well, why don't they make it so the spoon just sort of, uh, the, the, the stabilizer, the little fork mm -hmm. thing, locks into position so you can get it just right and it'll be, it'll hold stiller yeah. than your assistant yeah. could. And he said, yeah, I'm sure somebody's working on that. And I said, I, I guess it's me. <laughs> yeah, right? So uh, I'd, I'd never made anything. I'd never even done any animal work at that mm -hmm. point. I, I mean, I was just launching my career. Yeah. But I found out we had an animal facility at the Beth Israel Deacons. Yeah. I didn't have a machine shop. We were living in the North End in an apartment building. Yeah. In Boston. In Boston. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was on the faculty at Harvard yeah. Medical School. Yeah. And so I envisioned something that sort of looked like a flattened spoon. So I thought, that's a good place to start. I went and bought spoons. I would draw on them with a Sharpie marker, what the pattern I had in my right. head and having different features that would conspire to, to, to make the thing work. And then cut them out with a Dremel, a little motor tool right. or a hacksaw and file them. And then take them down to the first floor of our apartment building uh, where it was a concrete floor so I could bash them with a hammer. And I'd bring them into work the next day. And there was an animal lab where uh, some sci researchers were doing animal work where at the end of the experiment, the animals were euthanized. Yeah. I'd say, can I try this on them before you do that? And they said, sure. And sometimes the device would fail miserably and I'd be sprayed with blood yeah. or it would cut through the tapes or it wouldn't work for one reason or another, but sometimes it would sort of work. And then with iterations, I got working very well. I finally got up my nerve and had the chief, went to the chief of our division and said, I've got a new technology I'd like you to see. I took him down to the animal lab and showed him an animal operation with a cut up soup spoon. And he said, when's your first patient? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, Billy, there is a long, rich history of physicians and surgeons using homemade stuff in the operating room. You can't leave it in the patient. You certainly can't sell it. But if it, you think it helps you achieve the desired result in a patient, you're free to use whatever you want. So we scheduled a patient. I told him that I was gonna be using a cut up soup spoon. He said, are you confident? And I go, very confident. He said, let's go. And it worked beautifully. Wow, but that was your first innovation. But that was my first wow. successful innovation. And it was trivially easy. It had yeah. about as much mechanical complexity as a, a McDonald's Happy Meal toy. Right. It was a little thing with some places where rubber bands could cleat. And I realized there, and it's had an impact, real impact on me then and over and over again, how simple some of the most important innovations in our world are. So, so is it true though that, that your interest in innovation and doing these things has led to your participation in, in this artificial heart that seems to be growing big time now? Yeah, this is the holy grail of medical technology. And people have been trying to do this since the uh, 1960s. Right. And Houston was sort of the epicenter of that kind of work when right. I was training. Right. But um, people have been trying to make artificial hearts uh, to treat heart failure and mm -hmm. cardiac death. Mm -hmm. Number one cause of death across every demographic. Statistically, either you or I will die of heart mm -hmm. failure, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there's half a million people that die every year in the United States alone of heart failure, which is a slow, progressive decline in heart function, and then another million that die of cardiovascular death. Mm -hmm. So, huge opportunity. We can transplant patients. We can cut your heart mm -hmm. out and sew a new heart in. But last year, we did 3,000 heart transplants in the United States. Usually it's about 2,200, 2,500. Mm -hmm. Last year was the busiest year we've ever had. Okay. But 3,000 with a half a million people mm -hmm. dying mm -hmm. of heart failure that we can see happening over months and months and have plenty of time to react. Mm -hmm. And then another million that die of COVID. You know, 3,000 counting on heart transplantation to cure heart failures like counting on the lottery to cure poverty. Okay. It's just so right. we need an artificial heart. Okay. No, no. Eureka, right. everybody knows that. But people have been trying for decades to make one. It turns out, as I mentioned earlier, if your heart's beating 80 times a minute, that's 132,000 times a day, mm -hmm. that's 42 mm -hmm. million times a year. No man-made device can do that. Flexible membranes, valves, opening and closing, whatever the mechanism that's driving that mm -hmm. wears out. Wear out. Yeah. Like how far can you drive a car before yeah. you open up the hood and work on it? Right. You can't get to this to work on it. So. 
uh, people have spent billions of dollars trying to make an artificial heart, and right now everybody's given up. Well, our group tried to leverage continuous flow pumps, and everybody said, well, you can't do that because you need a pulse. Well, do you need a pulse? Has anybody done that experiment? Well, we've now done 90 cows, and I can tell you with great authority, you don't need a pulse. Okay. Just like in aviation, all the original efforts at making mm -hmm. heavier-than-air mm -hmm. flying machines had flapping wings. That was way too challenging. Mm -hmm. Materials weren't strong enough. It took too much power. It's only once they abandoned flapping wings, made fixed wings, mm -hmm. and a rapidly spinning propeller mm -hmm. that heavier-than-air flight became a right. practical reality. Name a bird or flying insect that uses a propeller. Yeah, there aren't any. They're not. So when we made the intellectual shift and started using a pair of turbines and did animal after animal and saw these animals eat, sleep, poop, grow, we'd shave them, their hair would grow back quickly, we said, God, you don't need a pulse. And people say, what about this, what about that, what about this, what about that? They're all tangential issues right. that don't address that that. Where did that, where, who came up with the first thing about My it? partner, Bud okay. Frazier, okay. was the first person to embrace it. And he would submit papers uh, for publication and they would say, well, this may be of some scientific interest, but no practical right. importance. Now 50,000 of these pumps have been implanted to assist the failing heart. We're the first group to say, look, we're gonna make a, a continuous flow artificial heart. And this device, uh, we were working on our twin turbine pump because your heart's two pumps, right? right. Your heart, one pump takes blood from your veins right. and pumps to the lungs. The other pump <clears throat> takes the red blood returning from your lungs and pumps to your body. That's how your heart works. Right. But we said we'll emulate that with two rapidly spinning pumps. And it worked well but had some challenges. We met a group in Brisbane, Australia who'd figured out a way to make it so there's only one moving part, right. a double-sided turbine, if you will. It's a double-sided disc with rotors on it that can move so it can aut autonomously balance the two circulations. The moving part is floating in an electromagnetic field so there's no mechanical wear, so it'll never wear out. It'll outpump your heart by a factor of four. It's smaller than a heart. So I mean, what's this, are we putting it in, in replace? Yeah, what we're, so what we'll first do, we haven't put it in a human yeah, yet, yeah. although we did put our twin turbine heart in a patient right. and it ended up on the cover of Popular Science and National yeah, Geographic, yeah. got a lot of lay press. But the good thing about that is it got us on the radar of this group in Brisbane, Australia, okay. that came down and said, listen, we think we are, can address your shortcomings. Wow. We looked at it and said, yep, and we completely pivoted, brought them to Houston, and now I'm chief medical officer of that, of that organization. Right. But so this, we think, will be the first practical artificial heart in the world. So now, how sick do you need to be before heart failure? I mean, if you couldn't walk from here to that door without stopping and yeah. catching your breath, yeah. we could do an elective operation in the morning with a fresh team, because transplant's always in the middle of the night. Right. Because you never know when the heart's gonna become right. available. And you have to have a jet to go get it, and teams, and multiple teams from multiple hospitals to harvest all the right. organs. It's maximally inconvenient, and figuring out who you're gonna use this precious heart in. Right. If we had a whole shelf with 50 of them on it, and we'd say, let's see, you're about a 36 long, <laughs> and we could do it in the morning, right. before, they were gasping for their last breath and were really high operative risk. Right. But just when they were starting to fail, wow. maybe this will be the cure for heart failure. Fantastic. Billy, I really appreciate you uh, sharing your perspective with us. I Thanks. encourage you to keep doing uh, what you're doing. And we want to visit you at, uh, at the J-Labs Institute. Yeah, so come you can out. go through this the whole- This new Center for Device yeah. Innovation will blow you away. That's fantastic. So, uh, I, I am the Tony Stark of medical device there, innovation. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thank you so much. And that wraps up my uh, interview with Dr. Billy Cohn. Thanks. <laughs>